We gather to worship in the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Spirit for the occasion of the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the ordination of women in the ELCA predecessor bodies. Let us join together in prayer. Gracious and living God, we rejoice and give you thanks for your strength on display throughout time and place, calling all kinds of people to be witnesses to your grace and power. We celebrate how the Spirit has blessed your church through the work of women and girls, including in this time and place. Guide us as your people into welcoming your prophets and teachers among us and into hearing Christ's good news through them. With gratitude, we pray. Amen. Today we give thanks for the many ways that women have proclaimed the gospel, including as pastors for the past 50 years, and for the impact that proclamation has had on more people than we can ever count or know. We rejoice and give thanks to God for the ways the church's decision to ordain women allowed fresh air to blow through the church, opened up closed windows and flung wide closed doors, enabling new possibilities for women to answer God's call and fresh ways for people to hear the good news. We rejoice and give thanks to God for the ways women have pushed this church in new directions, for the distinctive gifts each woman brings from her culture, her gender, her sexuality, and far beyond. We rejoice and give thanks to God. For the ministries of women of color, the vibrancy they bring, the wisdom they share, the word they proclaim, and the sacraments they administer. We rejoice and give thanks to God for the ministry of LGBTQIA pastors who have enriched the church by their dedicated service throughout history and for the 10 years since the ELCA's policy change, enabling them to serve publicly and live authentically, including while in partnered relationships we rejoice and give thanks to God. For the people who had the courage and perseverance to work for the ordination of women, including our predecessor women's organizations, for congregations who had the courage to call female pastors, and for the church's ability to change, we rejoice and give thanks to God. For all women, the polite and the powerful, troublemakers and peacemakers, those who make the coffee, those who pay the bills, those who put the chairs away and lock the doors at the end of the night, for the deacons and deaconesses, the teachers and the prayer chain maintainers, for all those who stayed up late and got up early doing work that no one ever saw or acknowledged but that slowly transformed people's lives and the church. And for the generations of women who didn't get a title, but served God just the same, we rejoice and give thanks to God. For the support women have given and received over the decades, for the late night phone calls, the chats over lunch, the affirmations and the hugs when words fell short for the spouses, children, parents, mentors, teachers, and theologians whose impact cannot be measured, and for those who show up and those who speak out in quiet and loud ways, we rejoice and give thanks to God. For the apostolic witness of Mary Magdalene, the dance of Miriam, the hospitality of Lydia, the prayer of Mary, the discernment of Deborah, and the courage of the midwives, and for the faithfulness of our biblical foremothers, we rejoice and give thanks to God.
We come before God and each other today, celebrating the anniversaries of the ordination of women in the Lutheran Church in the United States. Within the celebration, there is also our corporate need to acknowledge the ways in which we have not supported women in ministry, overtly and covertly, knowing and unknowingly. Oh God, as we give thanks for the ministry of ordained women throughout the decades, we also acknowledge and name the ways in which we have not been faithful supporters of women in ministry. For women who have been excluded from ministry because they were women, God of mercy, hear our prayer. For women who were dismissed from positions they held, those who quietly or not so quietly disappeared with little warning or explanation, God of mercy, hear our prayer. For women who have been bullied, harassed, mistreated, or abused by ministers and lay people in this church, God of mercy, hear our prayer. For women who have voluntarily left positions they held because they could no longer withstand the pressures and stresses placed upon them by impossible expectations, God of mercy, hear our prayer. For female pastors of color who have had to deal with microaggressions, insults, and injuries, and for female pastors who had to wait many years for a call and those who never received a call. God of mercy, hear our prayer. For women who not only are targeted by sexism, but also deal with intersecting burdens of racism, heterosexism, ableism, and socioeconomic inequality. God of mercy, hear our prayer. For female pastors whose commitment to motherhood has been questioned or judged, and for female pastors whose singleness has been questioned or judged, God of mercy, hear our prayer. For women who were passed over for positions of leadership because they were women. For women whose gifts were rejected or never acknowledged because they were women. For the thoughts, words, and deeds we have participated in that have excluded women. And for the work that is left undone. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Receive our confession, God of mercy, and give us strength to commit anew to the full inclusion of women at all levels of work and ministry in this church and throughout the world. Amen.
pastor at Peace Lutheran of Pigeon Falls. Karen Bailing, our Savior's Lutheran in Chippewa Falls. My name is Erin Nelson. I serve the Northwest Synod of Wisconsin as the director for Evangelical Mission. I'm Kathy Pennington, and I serve East Emmanuel Lutheran in Amory. I'm Lori Ruge Jones, campus pastor at University Lutheran Church in Alcalair, Wisconsin. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Beer, and I am the pastor at the One in Christ Lutheran Parish, which is a three-point parish in Withy, Longwood, and Greenwood, Wisconsin. I am Annie White-Ladnier. I am serving at Hope Lutheran in River Falls. I felt the call to ministry when I was 16. I actually grew up in the United Church of Christ in Amory, Wisconsin. Um, had a wonderful woman pastor. Actually, my dad was on the call committee for, for her to be there. She was the first woman pastor uh, in Amory. And so for me, it was never a big deal to even um, think about having a woman pastor. So I was at a youth event, and I can remember exactly where I, where I was in the church, at the congregational church, what I was wearing, this profound sense of call. But I didn't have the words for it. It was the Lutherans who told me the, the words actually of this actual call, but this, it just tugged and tugged and tugged at me. And so um, I, I went off to St. Olaf College thinking I was going to be a religion major, and God had other plans um, that included uh, religion, but all kinds of, of ventures unknown. So um, I kept getting this tug at me, and um, I actually realized it was God that who kept calling, and I kept hanging up on him. And so uh, eventually it took me until I was about 40 years old that I started seminary, and I'm glad that God was persistent because every time I hung up on him, he pressed redial. So here I am. Growing up, I actually had all female pastors on staff um, for every year until I went to seminary. And so I actually grew up not having any question that a pastors could be women. And I felt a call to ministry when I was in high school. And part of my story also goes with my mom's call story because she started seminary when I was in high school. And part of what I learned from her is that any life experience only enhances my ability to serve well in a call as pastor. And so I took that opportunity for some life experience and service before going into seminary. And um, when I got there, I started hearing stories from other women of the challenges that they had in ministry or telling their story to their family and friends. And um, that made me realize the benefit that I'd had and give thanks for the women who have come before me and paved pathways so that I can stand up here and say, of course, uh, women can be pastors. One of the men I supervised presented me with a haiku that he had written in my honor. It's just written on a regular 3x5 index card, but I framed it because this means a whole lot to me. A haiku for Karen. Wise woman leader, by the strength of your witness, I am enlightened. That's wonderfully validating. We have two stories of women in the Bible, the midwives, Shifra and Pua, enact the stance of civil disobedience to save Moses and defy the unjust law. And then Miriam's song of celebration is possibly one of the oldest sections of the Hebrew scriptures. This celebration scene demonstrates Miriam's role as a leader and as a prophet leading people in praising God and in a song of thanksgiving for salvation from harm. Now a new king arose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, and they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more that they were oppressed, and the more, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, 
When you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt, w dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. When the horses of Pharaoh and his chariots and his chariot drivers went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Then the prophet Miriam, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and with dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. The word of the Lord. Paul wants the Galatian Christians to understand that they are all equally valued by God. The distinctions that seem important in the world do not exist in God's kingdom. Christ calls, clothes, and commissions all people equally for God's work in the world. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The word of the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. The word of the Lord. Hello, people of God. I'm Pastor Lori Scow Anderson, and I serve as the Bishop of the Northwest Synod of Wisconsin. Before I begin, I want to thank you for your faithful witness to the love and grace of Jesus Christ during these last nine months. I am grateful for your partnership and support during this challenging time. Dear friends, we are all tired, and we have all struggled to understand what it means to live with a pandemic and how we are to continue the work that God has given us. Together we wonder what life and ministry will look like on the other side of the real challenges we face today. Today's sermon will begin by looking back in history to amazing people who overcame great challenges. And then we will end by looking to the future. What is God calling us to do now after this pandemic? Today we mark the 50th anniversary of the ordination of women in the Lutheran Church in North America. Can you remember the name of the first woman pastor that served your church? Or the first woman pastor you met? How have they shaped your life? Say their names out loud. For me, it's Lynn Carlson and Beth Ann Gady. Women have been pastors in the Lutheran Church for 50 years. That's a big deal. On the one hand, it's a big deal, but on the other hand, women have been active in faithful ministry since the earliest and most challenging of times. Our Bible readings for today name four women of great faith and amazing ministry who lived long before there was a rite of ordination. Today, we really recognize the ministry of all women. Today I want to talk about two women from our Exodus reading, two women who were so important that we even know their names. 
Shifra, and Pua. They were the two midwives who lived during the time of one of the pharaohs of Egypt. The pharaoh, as you all know, was a great ruler who felt his power threatened by the growing number of foreigners, the Hebrew people who lived in Egypt. They were descendants of Joseph and his 11 brothers, who followed Joseph from their homeland to Egypt during the famine. After Joseph died, the new pharaoh enslaved the Hebrew people, yet they continued to grow in numbers. Midwives like Shifra and Pura through the centuries have been called to help the vulnerable pregnant women through their labor pains, to deliver their babies, to bring new life into the world. Pharaoh, who was afraid of losing power and control, ordered the midwives to kill the baby boys as soon as they were born. Imagine that if you can, ordering the ones who were charged to bring life into the world to end life. The Pharaoh was asking them to go against the very nature of their work to help him for his own political gain. This is the story of a powerful leader threatened by a group of people he then oppressed and enslaved, and two women who defiantly and cleverly claimed their power, the power that they had to disobey the king's orders. They did not kill the babies. They protected the baby boys. This is a story of courageous women who followed God and were engaged in courageous acts of civil disobedience that changed everything. The midwives, Shifra and Pua, were women of courage and faith. Midwives were present when Moses was born, and to save his life, Moses' mother wrapped him in, and put him in a reed basket. And I can imagine his sister Miriam singing a new song as she watched, watched over her little brother Moses as he floated in the basket on the River Nile until he was discovered by the Pharaoh's daughter. And then at the request of Pharaoh's daughter, Miriam found a nurse for the baby in the basket, the baby's own mother. The Pharaoh's daughter paid her to nurse her own infant. Today we celebrate the clever, creative women who were faithful to God even when it meant opposing powerful male leaders. Life was horribly difficult for God's people in Egypt. Their children were not safe. They cried to God under the horrible weight of oppression and slavery. And God called Moses to go to this Pharaoh and demand that he let the people go. Guided by God, Moses led the Hebrew people out of slavery, out of Egypt, through the Red Sea. Pharaoh regretted his decision to let them go and sent his army after them. The army did not make it through the sea, but the Hebrew people did. They were free. Safely on the other side of the Red Sea, we read again about Miriam. Miriam is a woman so important in the story of salvation that she's given the title Prophet. Prophet Miriam sang a new song as she saw the transformation that comes from liberation, being freed from slavery. She sang a new worship song of praise and thanksgiving to God for freedom and a new song of wonder and awe for the miracle of crossing the sea onto dry land. We celebrate the ministry of Prophet Miriam who leads the people in worship for all that God had done for them. Today we celebrate not just the 50th anniversary of the ordination of women, but the ministry of all women called by God in all times. Today our gospel reading is from Luke chapter 1, and Mary is called by God. Mary responds to the call to be the mother of our Savior with the simple, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And then she sings this song. She sings, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Today we remember young Mary and her faithful courage to believe in God, who is about to do a wondrous thing in her life and in the lives of all people. She is to give birth to a son, and he will free them from slavery to sin. He will save his people from death. He is our Passover lamb, and we celebrate the bold witness of Mary's new song, that God's love is for all people, no exceptions. Her song gives hope to the poor and oppressed, hope for justice and mercy. God will do great things. God has called Mary, and she sings. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and set the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. Today we celebrate not just the 50th anniversary of the ordination of women, but of all women in all times, the faithful women of the Bible. The midwives, Shifra and Pua, who lived during dangerous times, they were respected working women, faithfully birthing new life and hope and courage and, and through civil disobedience. And Miriam, a woman with the title, the title prophet, leading the peoples, God's people in the worship, singing a new song, and celebrating God's power to liberate. 
And we remember Mary, called by God to serve and to bear God's light and hope into the world, to give birth to the Son of God, who will ultimately free us all from bondage. She sings that song of hope for those who are suffering. Biblical women, bold women, showing the way beyond patriarchy, changing the world. And today we remember the ministry of the women of the Reformation, vowed religious women of the Catholic Church who had leadership during the Protestant Reformation, called by God with strength of character, women like Katie Van Bora, Katie Luther. And we remember the immigrant women in this country, who with courage and boldness leave their family and friends, cross the ocean, cross rivers, cross borders, learn a new language and survive in a new land, looking for a safe place to raise their families and a hope for a better life, sharing their faith, sharing the story of Jesus with the next generation. And today we remember our mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers, the work of the early women missionaries, the quilts that were sewn and health kits assembled for Lutheran World Relief. We remember Ladies' Aids and Women's Auxiliary, women of the ELCA working for justice, faithful women through the generations, all of these women were bold and courageous and faithful and persistent and made incremental progress to turn the head of a patriarchal society, a patriarchal church, and make way for the ordination of women. Women have struggled since the earliest of times to stand on even footing with men. Men have historically considered women less than equal partners in life. They have dominated, controlled, and even considered wives and daughters their property. They were not allowed to vote or own property, receive inheritance, speak in public, participate in sports, choose certain careers, or even get an education. The Bible was used as proof text for male control over women in the same way it was used to maintain slavery in our country. The ordination of women was women's step in moving beyond the patriarchal nature of our church and society. When Elizabeth Platt was ordained as pastor in 1970, it was a major paradigm shift in our male-dominated society, church, and seminaries, it was a shocker. Sexism reared its ugly head in many ways in the early years. I was ordained a Lutheran pastor on September 14, 1986, 16 years after Elizabeth Platt. At that time, there were only about 600 Lutheran women clergy in the United States. There weren't a lot of us. I served four congregations in Minnesota. I was the first woman pastor many had seen or heard. I was a novelty and I represented change. It was not easy for me to be an ordained woman in those early years. In 2018, I was elected the first woman to serve as bishop of this synod. I love being a pastor, and I love serving as bishop, but over the years, there have been challenges. On the slide, you'll see comments and situations that have happened to me over the years. Most now I can laugh about, but others still sting. Years ago, after I performed a, a wedding and signed the marriage license, the father of the bride asked me if it was going to be legal. I went to make a hospital visit, and the elderly patient remarked, oh, it's so nice the pastor's wife came to visit. At a council meeting, I was criticized for being too opinionated and bossy. At meetings, the committee members would only look at and talk to the, my male co-pastor. Someone remarked to me the only reason that I won the bishop's election was because of the Me Too movement. On internship, my stewardship committee member said, we could raise more money for the church if you just wear a bikini. Someone told me that pastors should not wear open-toed shoes because they're too suggestive. The call committee asked me questions about childcare, but not the male pastor they were interviewing. I was once criticized for picking up my child and carrying him out of church during the recessional hymn. It's difficult to believe, but these are all true. I was an easy target for sexist remarks, and the change I represented caused some anxiety in the churches I served. It was difficult for me as an early woman pastor, but it was even more difficult for women of color. It was just 40 years ago this year that the first African-American woman was ordained in our church, and it's only been 10 years since the first LGBTQIA persons have been ordained in the Lutheran church. What does this all mean? Why is this important? While things have improved a great deal in the last 50 years, there is still significant sexism in our country, our world, and our church. This is a justice issue. Women still get paid less than men. Fewer women are senior pastors. Women are often without call or on leave for a longer period of time than men. In other Lutheran denominations, women can't vote or be pastors. And there are many places in the world where women 
have not made much progress against patriarchy. In our companion synod in Malawi, there aren't any women pastors yet. There are theologically and seminary trained women, and hopefully someday soon the first woman will be ordained in Malawi. Why is this important? Because it's about justice. Because there is still work to do. We have all heard the saying, women's rights are human rights. Women around the world still have a long way to go to have equal rights with men in, cu in their cultures. Women struggle for their rights, struggle to endure in a patriarchal society. In dozens of countries around the world, women are not allowed or restricted or discouraged from attending schools. There are one-third more women who are illiterate than men in the world. Women are not allowed in some places to work, to own property, to inherit property, not allowed to vote, hold public office, or be represented in the government. In some places, women can be shamed and arrested for not wearing appropriate or approved clothing. Women can't get a passport or travel without male chaperones. And until recently, in some places, women were not allowed to drive a car. Gender-based violence, sexual abuse, rape, domestic violence, sex trafficking, child and arranged marriages, genital mutilation are still happening around the world. And dear friends, these are justice issues. The rights of LGBTQIA persons are under attack here and around the world. Women's rights are human rights. The 50th anniversary of the ordination of women in the United States is important because it raises awareness that we still need to work for justice, for gender justice, here in this country and around the world. The midwives, Shifra Pua, engaged in civil disobedience as they rocked those living babies they helped to bring into the world against the king's orders. Miriam sang a new song and led God's people in worship of a God who delivered them from slavery. Mary sang a new song of God's promise that was realized in her son, in Jesus Christ. They were women who courageously and faithfully worked against injustice, against the injustice of tyranny and patriarchy, against the injustice of slavery and oppression. Micah 6.8 This is what the Lord requires of you. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. The best way we can celebrate the 50th anniversary of the ordination of women is by thanking a woman who has helped you grow in faith and love toward God and toward your neighbor. The best way we can celebrate the 40th anniversary of the ordination of women of color and the 10th anniversary of the ordination of LGBTQIA pastors is to work for racial and gender justice in our world. The best way we can celebrate the anniversary of the ordination of women is to courageously and prophetically tell a hurting world the good news, the good news story about Jesus who loves us, who loves us unconditionally and without limits. This has been a challenging year in so many ways. Women have always provided leadership in challenging times. We are called to lean into leadership today in new ways. Dear friends, celebrate the ministry of all women, and together let us work courageously and faithfully until justice and equity exists for all people. No exceptions. Amen.
With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. For the women who faithfully serve as bishops, pastors, and deacons, for those first to be ordained and those most recently ordained, especially Bishop Elizabeth Eaton, Bishop Lori Scow Anderson, and those serving in the Northwest Synod of Wisconsin, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the visible unity of the church and for ongoing dialogue between church bodies that do not agree on the ordination of women, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For lay people who do vital work through church ministries of hospitality, outreach, teaching, music, and dance, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for women and girls around the world who are ostracized from their communities for any reason or treated as less than children of God, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those whose hard work is rarely praised and whose names are forgotten though their work lives on, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the women who nurtured us in faith whether in our family of birth or in the family of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For what else do we pray? We invite you in silence to lift up those things that are on your hearts at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, most high God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting that your steadfast love is greater than the heavens and your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. Another thing that I really, um, I really enjoy uh, is a new title that I have to my ministry that oftentimes children call me Grandma Pastor, which is awesome. I've been thinking about the best thing about being a woman pastor is the community of sisters with whom I get to share this ministry. Ever since I was in seminary, I have had a group of women pastor friends and also deacon friends, um, and. I could not do this work without them. They make me a better pastor and a better person and a better mom and a better partner. And we pray for each other and we share our lives together. So having that um, community of other women has been such a blessing and so important for me as pastor. And I'm so glad that we can celebrate 50 years of doing this together and look forward to 50 more years. I'm not going to work that long, but um, of uh, women being in ministry and bringing the wholeness of who we are to this work. A humorous story about being a female pastor. This actually happened during my senior year of seminary, but I was doing pulpit supply, and my husband and I go to the congregation, and 15 minutes before the start of the service, I'm up front, 
getting everything prepared and just getting the layout. My husband is sitting in the pews and he's listening to all this chatter about who's that person? I haven't seen them before. They look so young. Is she old enough to be a pastor? And then it's time for the service to start. And my husband had, is sitting behind these two older men and we're standing, we're doing the brief order for confession and forgiveness. And there's chatter about, well, we can't see the pastor. And one guy says, yeah, we may not be able to see her, but she sure has a set of pipes. And so that kind of marked my ministry, the beginning of my ordination. I'm called now to um, uh, definitely a Norwegian church in rural America, and I think I was maybe their shock. Um, I am their first uh, pastor um, that is a woman at that congregation. I claim my Swedish heritage, and I'm left-handed, which means the altar was all switched around, but being a left-handed pastor also meant they have a pastor that's in their right mind. The day when they voted to call me as their pastor, after they had made the vote, the choir was still in the sanctuary and they were rehearsing for a coming Sunday and they heard all of this crashing and wondered what was going on. They went down in the basement to investigate where all of these larger than life portraits of the previous uh, pastors had been hanging and several of them had come crashing down and their interpretation was that all of these men were rolling over in their graves because they had called a woman pastor. May the joy of God's freedom cause your spirit to dance. May the presence of God's peace bring wholeness to your body and mind. May God give you blessing, and may all the ends of the earth stand in awe. 
In the name of Almighty God, Holy Parent, Holy Son, Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.